Legendary New York Post theater columnist Michael Riedel has always got a story up his sleeve. Now readers can get their hands on Singular Sensation, The Triumph of Broadway, a follow-up to his acclaimed bestseller, Razzle Dazzle, The Battle for Broadway. Hear about the life-changing childhood production he himself took the stage in, his thoughts on the Broadway shutdown, and more on this week's Show People. Mr. Riedel, good to see you. Good to see you, Paul. How are you holding up? I have to say, it it has not been too bad here in the coronavirus. I mean, I miss Broadway, of course. I miss my friends. I miss uh, I miss drinks at Sardi's. I miss uh, a hamburger at Joe Allen. But um, I was working on the book, trying to finish the book when the COVID hit. And there's nothing better for a writer than the... Um, a COVID virus because it shuts you down and it makes you have to write. And I tried to, have, I tried to had to uh, finish the book right there. So, you know, if, if COVID had not hit, I would have been um, writing this book for another, another two years. So it focused <laughs> everything that I had to do. You're talking about this, this fantastic book, by the way, the singular sensation, uh, the triumph of Broadway. The last line is Broadway is in the midst of its new golden age. So, which which is it's almost like a heartbreaking end to your book because now now we are in this confusing time. The whole idea of the book was that Broadway in the nineteen nineties became a big business. I mean, you and I lived it. I mean, we saw how big it became, and we saw Broadway go from the backwaters of the cultural world to the front waters, right? where everybody wanted to be on Broadway. All the movie stars wanted to be right. on Broadway. And every everybody was like buying up all the shows on Broadway. And Broadway just reached this point in the 1990s where it was fundamentally, again, important to the American cultural landscape. Right. And it was like, boom, this business is huge. And then boom, in... September 11th happened and I thought this is the end of Broadway. Hmm. You know, when the, when the world trade center was knocked down, I thought that is the end of it. That is the existential crisis, right? New York is finished. We don't know what's going to happen. Times square is now on the top 10 list of Giuliani's terrorist attack places. I thought, my God, what is going to happen? Hmm. And then Broadway came back in two days, right. two days later, the producers opened up at, at the St. James Theater and they performed that show for about 500 people because people were scared. Remember that people were scared sure. to go back to the theater. It's ironic now because people are really scared to go back to a theater. But back then they were really scared because Times Square could have been bombed. We did not know. And Matthew and Nathan led 1500 people singing God Bless America. And I thought, God, this is why I love New York. And this is why I love Broadway, because Broadway is New York. And without Broadway, there is no New York. As you mentioned, this book is a follow up to Razzle Dazzle. You, you, I love you. I love your references to the great musicals with your titles. You went from Razzle Dazzle to Singular Sensation. Razzle Dazzle, The Battle for Broadway, the New York Times bestseller. And this is The Triumph of Broadway. Um, had you always intended to do a follow-up? I mean, the first book, which everyone should read, by the way, it was so eye-opening for me. I really, you beautifully sort of told the entire history, the, the backstory of Broadway and all the all these moguls that sort of created this industry um, with the the sort of dramatic story being the the rebirth of Times Square, right? And, and uh, how, how Times Square in New York came out of the 70s and all the issues of 1970s New York City, but just beautifully told. Did you always intend on to keep going? And is are you going to keep going? I mean, obviously there's a lot more to be told. I mean, you could be writing, I mean, right now, there's a lot to be writing about right now. That, that might be book three or book four, but um, is this, do you intend this to be sort of your, Will, will you leave the world with with a, with a bunch of volumes of Michael Riedel history? I hope so because they're beautifully told. Oh, well, th- I appreciate that. But now the first book was something that I had learned just from my old friends uh, Jerry Schoenfeld 
and Jimmy Needlelander, the guys who created the whole landscape of Broadway as we know it. And they told me great stories. And I enjoyed the fight that they had, the Needlelanders versus yeah. Schubert. And the whole idea that New York City was down and out for the count in the 1970s. And the way the Schuberts and the Niederlanders, they stuck by Broadway when most of New York was finished. And I, the idea I had for the first book, Razzle Dazzle, The Battle for Broadway, was that these guys stuck by this thing that exists nowhere but right. in New York City. There was no Broadway anywhere else in the world. I know Broadway is now like this big thing that goes all over the place, but right. it began here in New York City. It began here right in Times Square, you know, the little neighborhood, you know, uh, that, that you and I used to know when we could get together for a drink somewhere. Right. A little tiny neighborhood. That's where we were. So that book was about how these guys saved, saved the city in a way because of the arts, mm -hmm. because of things like A Chorus Line and Dream Girls right. and Line and Cats, and Les Miserables, all those shows that we all love today that ultimately saved the whole area, saved the city. So when I was done with that book, and I think I ended it when Disney came on, right? and I thought, I don't have another book to do after that. But my editor, a great guy, Ben Lunen uh, at Simon & Schuster said, I think you have another book in you. And I said, well, what is that? He said, well, what could it be? And I I said, well, I really don't know, but, but then I began to think, you know what happened in the 1990s? Things changed. The early 90s, Paul, we still had Sunset Boulevard and Andrew Lloyd Webber and the British invasion. And I went back and I looked at old columns that I'd written. And then it occurred to me, you know what happened? Sunset Boulevard which I think is a terrific show with a great score. Yeah. But it didn't really make it. And then mm -hmm. some kid was writing something else that had nothing to do with, you know, old opera houses in Paris, old revolutions in Paris. Right. Old washed up movie stars. Some kid was writing something that was happening in New York right here and right now. And that kid was Jonathan, was Jonathan Larson. Yeah. And if you look back, Sunset Boulevard wins the Tony Award, I think, in 19, can't remember the days. 90, 90, 95. 95. And the next year, it's Rent. Jonathan yeah. Larson burst in and changed Broadway forever with Rent. It was like suddenly, the, wow, wow, this is rock music. We haven't heard this mm. in a while. Since, by the way, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice did it in 1970 with Jesus Christ Superstar. But Jonathan Larson says, I love Broadway, but this Broadway is not talking to me. Right. This is not the Broadway that I want. This is the Broadway that I've grow, grown up on that I love. But I have to write something about what I'm feeling, what I'm doing. I'm a struggling artist at the time. And man, rent changes everything. And it's the end of the British invasion and something else begins after Jonathan Larson comes along. And the tragedy of all is that he never saw what he did. I've read a lot about rent and I loved reading. Um, I just love how you tell these stories. You do a really great job of sort of finding the right people to tell the story. Um, you only left one detail out of your rent chapter, which is that I was the very first person in line for a $20 ticket for the very first pre <laughs> of rent. That's okay, you can add it to the paperback. Um, fun fact and true. I found this book really interesting because I was around for a lot of it. And you know, in fact, I, I interviewed Carolyn Menini like a few days before she was let go from Guys and Dolls, which is another uh, another one of the subjects of your, so that was a lost interview um, for Theater Week Magazine, where I first met you. So it, it's interesting um, when you've lived it, 
and you're and you're telling these stories. It must be a little different. Was there any any stories you really enjoyed, or certain shows you really loved digging into in this book in particular, or that you learned something about that maybe you didn't even realize? Yes, uh, uh, most of it, because I was a uh, smarty pants columnist back in the day, <laughs> and I thought I knew everything. But of course, going back to talk to my old friends, I never knew anything. Um, because as a reporter at the time, you are just, you know, trying to grasp a little bits in the air, right. uh, trying to make sense of the history. You go back to talk to the people and they tell you things. And well, with Carol, Carol and Menini, um, you know, Jerry Zachs has become a good friend. And I think I have a good chapter on guys and dolls. And by the way, guys and dolls was, was important because it reestablished the importance of American musical comedy. Right. Like, yeah, we have rediscovered American mm -hmm. musical comedy. But Jerry, you know, Jerry, Jerry was a dear friend of Carolyn Menini, and she was, I can't remember the name of the character right now. Sarah Brown. She was Sarah Brown, right. And Jerry had known her for years. They'd been in shows together. Yeah. And Jerry is like sitting there thinking you know, that the, the show is not working. This revival of Guys and Dolls with Faith Prince and Nathan Lane is not quite working. And it was Michael David, who was the producer of the show, who said, the problem is Carolyn Menini. She does not have the chemistry with um, Peter, Peter Gallagher. Yeah, Peter Gallagher. Yeah. Doesn't have it there. And then Jerry told me this, and this is why I think, you know, it's great to go back and be a historian um, because people can be honest with you. And Jerry told me, he said, I bought a ticket. It's my own show. I'm directing it. But something's wrong. And I have to sit there as an audience member who bought a ticket. Right. And he saw that there was no chemistry between P Peter Gallagher and Carol and Mignini. He said, and that was the fundamental flaw. And she was my friend and I had to fire her. Right. And if you read in the book, he had to make that phone call to her, which was deeply painful. But that phone call changed the course of the show. Mm. And Guys and Dolls then became what Frank Rich said, we have seen the rebirth of American musical comedy. And on the front on the front page of the New York Times. Exactly. But that that yeah. moment, but that moment that Jerry has to call her. Yeah. And fire her. That is what leads to what ultimately will become the success of the producers. And mm -hmm. and Paul, I'm always looking for those moments where people have to make tough decisions, hard decisions that will be incredibly painful that will change the course of the history of Broadway. And in that moment, I think that did it. Right. I remember once asking you about, at a, at a party, I remember asking you, why haven't you written about, the, there was some big backstage drama that happened at a big musical. I won't mention what it is. And you said, I don't care about that stuff. I just care about the business. I care about the money. I care about the, the business end of it. But I guess when you're writing a book like this, you, you have to find more of these personal stories as well. I mean, you want to make, I mean, listen, you and I love theater people. We've been together a long time over the years. And we know how great theater people are. And we know the struggles that they have. And I guess when I write a book, I want to show, I want to show the struggles that they have to get to the place where they want to go. Right. And I've learned, I was a, listen, you know, honestly, I was a, I was a total asshole back in the days. I was always mean and nasty and this and the other thing. But when I started writing books, I realized nobody sets out to write a bad show. They don't. Right. They, they're they trying to do their best. Sometimes they fail. And if they fail, uh, okay, they fail. I mean, you and I objectively can look at a show and can say, this is no good. You and right. I have sat through a lot of shows that are no good, right? right. I mean, come on. How many hours have we given up in our lives for shows that are no good? Sure. But man, but man, when they hit it, they hit it in a way you can't even imagine what these people can do. And mm -hmm. I tried to get in this book the struggle that they have. If you look at my chapters on The Lion King, 
Nobody knew what they had in Lion King. Right. They did not know. They had no idea. You think, oh, no, oh, the Lion King, it's make 800 gazillion billion dollars. Nobody knew right. what they had when they were in Minneapolis on that first pre preview. Disney took a chance on Julie Taymor. She was like the crazy woman from, you know, Lincoln Center. It was doing Juan Derry on a kind of a mess. I saw that thing. You know, like a puppet was breastfeeding the baby. It was a bit bizarre and weird. You have no idea. And then she comes up with the circle of life. And, and it, Paul, we're only in this business because these brilliant people come up with things that when you and I see them, because let's, let's be honest, I mean, you, and I, you and I are journalists, we can't come up with that stuff. But boy, right. when we see it, we know it. Mm -hmm. We know you it. Men you mentioned Julie Taymor, and you've mentioned a few times that you've, it you, sounds like you're saying you've softened, that you're not the Michael Riedel who, who became uh, very well known for your columns. Um, have you softened? Are you a different guy now? And when did that well, happen well, exactly? Only because I've been furloughed, so I don't get paid much money anymore. So there you go. <laughs> okay. No, you, I mean, you saw I mean, like you, you definitely, uh, you know, even in the book when you were talking about Rosie O'Donnell, you know, I remember, I remember actually being at the opening night party of Taboo, and you walked in, and I was like, "What the heck is he doing here? He can't, he can't have free drinks on Rosie O'Donnell's credit card." I did. I did. <laughs> uh, you, but back then, I feel like you had a certain reputation. But then, I guess during. Uh, Spider-Man, turn off the dark. It kind of even got it got bigger than ever. I, I suppose your your reputation. Yeah, you know, I would say. Um, look, I was never a theater guy. I was a. Uh, I, I, I cannot really tell you what my career was all a bit about, but um, I never really loved the theater. I fell in love with the theater as I covered it, but uh -huh. I always tried to cover it as a reporter who thought, okay, this is a business. Let's cover the business aspect of it. Right. I think right. that's kind of what made my career. And I was always interested in how do you make money? And there's a lot of money to be made on Broadway. Yep. And I guess um, with Julie Taymor, whom I love, I admired this woman so much for what she did with Lion King. And Paul, I don't, uh, you were must have been there. The Lion King exploded Broadway. I mean, The Lion King made Broadway bigger than anything else had made it. Right. I mean, do you remember seeing The Circle of Life the first time you saw it? Yeah. I mean, it still, it still has the effect on me, even though I know it's coming. Yeah. It's just magic. Yeah. I saw it in Minneapolis, I think the third or fourth preview. And I literally sat there like this. Can you see me on TV here? <laughs> I had my hand I, I had my arms like this. I thought, okay, all right, show me, show me. And, I'm, ah, <laughs> yeah. and, you're like, oh. and at the end of the circle of life, you thought, I have never seen anything like this in my life. And this is the excitement of the theater. Right. And this is what I try to get in those chapters I read about the Lion King. I mean, I all I tell you, honestly, I had, I, I was knocked out by that moment. The first time in Minneapolis, I saw the circle of life. You could not, I remember thinking, I cannot come up with the words to describe what I have seen. Right. And then you think about all the kids who have fallen in love with theater because of it. You, so you weren't exposed to anything as a kid that sort of like got you to fall in love with this? Did you see a lot of theater when you were a kid? Where'd you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Geneseo, New York, a uh, small town in upstate New York. And um, uh, theater was, well, theater was not a big part of my life. I mean, I was in the um, Diary of Anne Frank uh, which was in upstate New York and Geneseo, and there were no uh, uh, no Jewish people in my neighborhood. So we were all Catholics and Protestants doing the di Diary of Anne Frank, uh, which could have been terrible. I played uh, Jan Dussel. Now, do you know this? Jan Dussel, this is interesting. Jan Dussel was the dentist who was brought in to the annex. And I actually have gone to the annex in, um, in Holland in uh -huh. um, 
uh, to, to see where Anne Frank lived. Yeah. And the dentist was there and I played him. And that was kind of the only exposure I had to the theater. But I remember this and that all the waspy people I grew up with were incredibly moved and touched by the fact that people were trying to save themselves from something horrible uh, that is happening. And that uh, scarred me for life. Hmm. And it made me kind of be, you know, study history of Columbia and learn about hmm. World War II and, uh, you know, the Holocaust. And, and I think it was because I was in the Diary of Anne Frank that I did go to um, all the concentration camps in uh, Eastern Europe when I was a kid in school in the 80s. I went to Auschwitz, I went to Birkenau, I went to uh, Majdanek. And, well, I, I, you know, I don't know if you want to go into this rabbit hole, but uh, it taught me a lot about man's inhumanity to man. Hmm. And I remember as a kid in the 70s, watching this PBS series. It was called The Ascent of Man. Jacob Bernowski went back to... Um, the end of Auschwitz, and I've been there. I have to wipe away a tear thinking about mm. it. And he went, he went back there, and he dipped his hand into that pond. Where he put, he pulled up the ashes of his, um, of his relatives hmm. I, and I was I stood at that pond and I have seen those I've seen those birch birch trees around that pond where you think five million people were killed there and their ashes are there and you know people don't uh, people forget that I have to mm. But I guess the point I'm saying is that the theater for me, when I was cast in the Diary of Anne Frank as a you know ninth grader in Geneseo, New York, I didn't know about the Holocaust. I right. didn't know about the theater. But there I was. And I suddenly realized there was something bigger than your little small life where you're mm. living. And there was history that you have to learn. Mm. And that's why, I mean, I don't want to say I fell in love with the theater because of the, of the Diary of Anne Frank. I wish I could say I fell in love with the theater because of Bye Bye Birdie. But <laughs> frankly, I have to be honest with you, Paul. It was the Diary, the Diary of Anne Frank where I thought, wow, I have to learn about things. Uh -huh. Through the theater, you can learn about things. So knowing how important theater is in terms of a teaching tool, how hard it is to make a show like you just talked about and how sensitive and difficult it is for theater artists, do you have any regrets about your uh, rabble rousing years? Uh, do you, or do you not live that way? I mean, you definitely had a lot of power and you definitely went after some subjects pretty ruthlessly in your prime. Uh, now you're a big softy, but back then, do you think that way or, or you just, you just don't think no, that way? No, no. I never look back. No, no. I mean, yeah. listen, I had fun and I have to say all the people that I used to, uh, zing and attack, yeah. um, they all became friends in a weird way. I mean, I, I would always be vicious and nasty and mean because I was making my name in the world. Yeah. And yet all the time they would always call me and say, you know what? You're right. You got the facts right. Hmm. You misinterpreted them. You uh, skewed them against us. But hmm. can we have a drink? Can we have dinner? And I, I, I would always meet with people because hmm. I was never, you know, I would, Paul, I was never, um, I was never the New York Times. Okay. I never had the sense that as the New York Times does, the arrogance of the New York Times, hmm. that we will tell you what is good and what is bad, and you will make your decision based on what we tell you to do. Hmm. Never had that sense. 
I was never a part of that world. I was a scrappy little reporter from the New York Post. So for me, it was always fun. You know, Mm -hmm. I never had the sense that I could decide what works or what doesn't. I liked Mm it. I didn't. I had good gossip here. I had good gossip there. We had a lot of fun. You know, I could upend your show. The press agents could be upset. But at the end of the day, we could always get together and say, you know, look, we're all in this together. I'm trying to make Broadway fun. You know, the times can be your guiding light. Oh, yes, Mm -hmm. please. If you compare, frankly, my writing compared to Michael Paulson's writing, I think you will find my writing is a little livelier than Michael Paulson's writing (laughs) or anybody else. Bruce Weber. I mean, I outlasted all those columnists. Jesse McKinley, Bruce Weber. God, I can't remember. I outlasted all of them because they they had a fundamental flaw. They were boring. <laughs> and my only, my only, the only thing I ever had was that I knew how to make Broadway lively because I loved it. I loved it. I mean, every show was a new world to explore. It was, yeah. good, it was bad. There was gossip. There was this. There was that. You know, it was make it fun. Make it fun. I never had any sense that I'm lording it over you the way the yeah. times did. We will yeah. tell you. I mean, I saw Ben Brantley, you know, Ben Brantley has left the New York Times. And he was like, yeah. well, I never want to be the same thing, Ben, Frank Rich, all these other people. But they all had this sense that we are the New York Times. And yeah. we will tell you what you want to enjoy and what you won't. Because <laughs> we are the paper of record. I never had that. For me, it was like, it's a scrappy, fun, crazy yeah. business. And yeah. let's just have fun and have a good time about it, you know. You're good at that. And and this book is is proof that you're a fantastic writer. And that's what I love about it, because I don't want people I don't want your legacy to just be, you know, the the troublemaker guy, because I, I know I know the real Michael Riedel. And so I love that uh, your writing is on display. And and I don't know, it's just it's just beautiful storytelling. And I'm really glad it's really nice for me to just I love seeing these stories just so beautifully encapsulated and, and the chapters aren't very long. You can get it. You can get a nice little nugget of history in one chapter and it's fantastic. I, I really love it. Congratulations. Will I see you in a Broadway theater uh, anytime? I mean, in 2021, 2020, I mean, we'll, we'll see, I guess. Listen, I mean, I want to support the arts. I mean, the arts, my life has been about the arts and yeah. You know, I'm no, I'm no, I'm no Mamby Pamby New York Times person. I'm a capitalist, but I think the arts have an important place in, in the world. The arts, fundamentally, to me, are about touching your heart and touching your soul. There's no politics about listening to Dvorak's New World Symphony. Mm. There's no politics listening to. I listened to it today um, at Gershwin's I Got Rhythm. Mm. There's no politics there. Right. There's just beauty. Mm-hmm. And I would like to get back to beauty. Me too. I would love to be back to beauty too. And I hope to see you there and row, row E on the aisle, Eddie on the aisle, Eddie 101 and 102. With the mask on. We'll have to have mask. <laughs> with, with, with the mask. Right. Eddie 101 and 104. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Michael, it was so good to see you. I've missed your face, and uh, everyone needs to it's check out. So the- in, it's not so good in the COVID virus because I don't shave anymore. It's all right. It's a look. It's a, it's, a, it's a good look. You look very comfortable and relaxed. And, uh, and Dora. Thank you for your time, Michael. <laughs> good to see you, Paul.